Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. I particularly want to thank Lenka Urbkova, Vlastima Havlik, for doing so much to arrange my trip here. I also want to thank Ivana Yashkova, who's done so much to arrange this particular talk. Thank you. Let me urge you, before I say anything else, to interrupt me during my talk if you have questions. I've watched your previous seminars. I know that's not your normal procedure. But I really like to take questions. I never mind being interrupted. You may ask a question that's simply too complex. It would take us too far afield. That's no problem. I'll just tell you I'm deferring that question to the end of the talk. Now, I was speaking on this same topic about contemporary politics in the United States and Denmark, and a student came up to me afterward, a good student, and he said, Professor, your talk was nice. He said in so many words, your talk was nice, but it was not very good. Um, <laughs> the problem with your talk, Professor, was that it didn't speak to our major concerns. We're following politics in the United States, and we are disturbed. Your politics in the United States seem so polarized, and some of your politicians do not seem sane. <laughs> the catch is that he didn't say these things to me this year or last year. He didn't say these things to me the year before that. He said these things to me in 2012 when Barack Obama was president and no one was thinking of Donald Trump. So I believe there are two ways that you can think about his comment. One is to see it as suggesting that recent changes in America are overrated and overstated. There are always people saying that America is falling apart. So if you hear people saying that today, maybe it doesn't mean much. Maybe it just, that comment comes from the sorts of people who always say these things. Or you could think of it this way. If American politics seemed so bad in 2012, how much worse must it seem today? I'm gonna show you that both of these views are partly correct. It's true that some bad and unusual things are happening right now in the United States that were not true or not nearly so true seven years ago. But those are not always the things that you hear about, even in the United States. Let me show you the plan for the talk today. I'm not going to advance any master thesis or overarching argument. Instead, I'm just going to advance a view of current American politics. I'm going to do it mainly by drawing on data about public opinion in the United States. And my focus is going to be the ways in which Americans are and are not polarizing. But I know that there's a lot of interest in Donald Trump, so I'm also going to speak about his election. I will build up to the election by speaking about important trends, mainly demographic trends in the United States that are, some of which are not well known even within the United States, but that I think are quite important. And then I'll speak about Trump's election itself. Many Americans are still asking, how did such a man become elected president of the United States? I'm gonna draw out ways in which his election was really unsurprising, very ordinary, at least in which the voting patterns were very ordinary, but then also some things that really were extraordinary about that election. All right, let me get started with the background information. To begin, I want to elaborate on two ideas to ensure that we are all on the same page. The first is partisanship. I am not speaking here of anything to do with registering with a party. I'm simply speaking of feeling like you are a member of one party or another. I'm going to speak exclusively of the two major parties in the United States, the Democratic and Republican parties. For 150 years, these have been the only major parties in the US. Um, historically and today, the Democratic Party is the more liberal of these two parties, although it is not liberal or leftist by Western European standards. The Republican Party is the more conservative of these parties. About 45% of American adults consider themselves Democrats. About 40% consider themselves Republicans. And the remaining 15% are independents. They just don't feel particularly like a member of either party. The second idea is polarization. When I use this term, I am not referring to people or groups holding extreme views, not necessarily. Instead, I'm referring to groups that are pulling apart or diverging over time, regardless of whether they take extreme views. For example, you might have two groups that have agreed on policy in the past. 
but over time they've come to disagree more on policy. Or perhaps they felt ambivalent or neutral about each other in the past, but they've come to really dislike each other in the present. There are many different ways to polarize, but the key here today is that whenever I use that term, I am always speaking about groups pulling apart over time. I'm going to be showing you a fair amount of data. Most of the data come from the American National Election Studies, or the ANES. This is a regular survey that we have been running for 70 years. It's probably our best survey-based source of political data in the United States. And then finally, I'm going to display that data mainly not through tables, but through graphs and charts. In those graphs and charts, following political convention, I'm always going to use the color red to represent Republicans or conservatives, and the color blue to represent Democrats or liberals. All right. Conventional wisdom in the United States, overwhelmingly, is that Americans are polarizing in all sorts of ways. Let me show you some evidence that, at least in some very important ways, they are not polarizing. First of all, in this figure, the lines indicate simply the percentages of people who identify with the Democratic or the Republican parties. If Americans were really polarizing along party lines, you might expect that they increasingly take a side with one party or another. And that's just not happening at all. Today, about 85% of Americans identify with one party or another. This makes the US today very different from the Czech Republic, where only about 60% of people identify with a party or a movement. But it makes the US today very much like the United States of 50 or 60 years ago, where, again, about 85% of people identified with a political party. Having said that, people can polarize in many different ways. And you might imagine, for example, that even if they're not polarizing in this sense, polarization is growing in the sense that um, those people who do identify with a party are more partisan than before. For example, maybe more than in the past, Democrats are supporting the candidate from their own party, the Democratic candidate, while Republicans are supporting the Republican candidate. Here are the lines of which I'm speaking. You can see that the red line is always lower than the blue line, reflecting the fact that in the United States, we've always had more people identifying with the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. You might ask, how is it possible then for a Republican ever to win an election, like the US presidency? Two major answers. One is that Republicans tend to vote at higher rates than Democrats. And the other is that just because you feel like a Democrat doesn't mean that you vote for a Democrat. Just because you feel like a Republican doesn't mean you vote for the Republican either. So the point here, again, is that Americans are not polarizing in the sense of identifying with parties more than before. Not at all. But you might think that maybe those who do identify with parties are polarizing in the sense that they more strongly support their own party's candidates than before. But that doesn't seem to be the case either. Here's the evidence. These lines are the proportions of Democrats and Republicans who support their own party's candidates. And the point is that in this century, represented by the shaded area on the right, there has not been much increase in these percentages. In the year 2000, Republican George W. Bush was running against Democrat Al Gore. Bush and Gore each got 88% of their party supporters. In the year 2016, the last points on these lines, the percentages were almost identical. Again, about 88% of Republicans voted for the Republican candidate, about 88% of Democrats voted for the Democratic candidate. In other words, we again see no polarization, certainly not in this century, not on this dimension. But you might say that there's a special reason why we see no polarization here, and it's that these percentages are already so high. They don't have much room to go higher. That's a fair point. So we need to consider still other ways in which people might be polarizing. Let me turn now to an idea that's become extremely popular in my own discipline of political science. It's the idea that partisans are polarizing with respect to their feelings about each other. So the idea is that Democrats and Republicans dislike each other more than before in a very personal way. For example, it has become very popular to say that in the present, 
nearly 50% of partisans would be upset if their son or daughter married somebody of the other party. But that claim, probably the most famous claim in this literature, turns out to be based on literally only three surveys taken over 60 years. That's a pretty small number of surveys to cover such a vast span of time. And in addition, there are other surveys, surveys besides these three, that contain this same question about marriage and do not support this claim about great polarization. The claim is, back in 1960, only about three to 5% of people said, I would be very upset if my daughter married a Democrat, and now nearly 50% of people say that. It's a shaky claim. You might look instead to other evidence that's brought up in this literature. Um, some of the evidence that I think most interesting comes from online dating services. In the United States today, about 40% of couples now meet through these online dating services. And when they use these services, they set up online profiles to describe themselves to potential partners. By one measure, most of the people who use these services in America now mention their party affiliation in these profiles. And often they're doing it to signal that they're not interested, or at least not as interested, in dating somebody of the other party. There are other kinds of um, evidence too. For example, experiments on discrimination. I'm only gonna give you one example here. You are a participant in an experiment. You are being asked to judge college scholarships. You read the applications of many students, but you don't have enough scholarships to award a scholarship to every student, so you have to decide which student gets the college scholarship, which does not. These applications, these student resumes, discreetly indicate the partisanship of the student. For example, typically in the United States, when you apply for a college scholarship, you would indicate your work experience or your volunteer activities. And the resume might state, in a very ordinary way, volunteered for the Democratic Party, worked for the Republican Party. The finding is that if you are a Democrat, you're more likely to give the scholarship to the Democratic student. If you're a Republican, you're more likely to give it to the Republican student. But this is the catch. You are more likely to give the scholarship to a student in your own party, even if it seems clear that the other student is better qualified by objective criteria. That probably is important. But this whole body of research has two large shortcomings, at least so far. First, as best we can tell, it does not do what we want it to do, in the sense that what we want it to do is to capture people's feelings about ordinary Americans, ordinary Democrats and ordinary Republicans. Instead, despite our best intentions, it seems to be capturing our attitudes towards activists and elites. For example, if you are a parent, and I ask you, how would you feel if your daughter married a Republican? It turns out that parents who are asked that question infer not just that my daughter is thinking about marrying a Republican, but that she's marrying, thinking of marrying somebody to whom being a Republican is very important. Being a Republican is a, is a critical part of that person's identity. Um, that makes that hypothetical Republican very unusual. Because in America, most people do not care about politics. Even most people who identify with a party really do not see it as a central part of their identity. So these questions seem to be capturing people's attitudes towards elites and activists rather than ordinary Democrats and Republicans. That's one problem. The other problem is simply that the evidence is thin. Until very recently, really the last seven years or so, we were not collecting much data on how people feel toward ordinary members of the other party. I don't mean to be too critical. On the whole, I think that this literature is onto something. I do suspect that Americans are polarizing emotionally along party lines. But the question has to be, how much are they polarizing? And we can't say on the basis of current evidence that polarization of this kind is great. You might say though, and many have said this, that people's feelings are not the most important thing to consider. The most important thing to consider is polarization of people's actual views on policy, because policy is the main way through which politics affect us. I'm sympathetic to that argument, so let's consider that. Ah. 
In this slide, I'm looking at attitudes towards seven major issues in the United States. Immigration, government-provided health care, aid to racial minorities, military spending, and more. For each issue, the ANES describes three liberal positions, from extremely liberal to slightly liberal, three conservative positions, and one centrist or moderate position. For example, you can tell the ANES that you want far less military spending, somewhat less, slightly less, you want to keep it the same, or you want slightly somewhat or much more military spending. Each colored line here, each of the thin colored lines, represents the percentage of people taking the centrist, the moderate position, the relatively mo the moderate position on an issue. And the thick black line shows what happens when we average over all of those issues. If that black line were declining, it would mean that fewer Americans are taking moderate positions. But here again, we have little evidence of polarization, and the evidence is that black line, it's not declining that much at all. In 1996, averaging over these seven issues that are perennially in the forefront of American politics, 37% of Americans expressed the moderate view. 20 years later, in 2016, it was 35%. So again, just not much change. You might think that even if the percentage of moderates in the population is holding steady, the percentages of liberals and conservatives are changing. That is happening, but only to a limited extent. Let me show you. In this slide, I'm averaging again over all of the seven issues that I talked about on the, pre on the previous slide. The black line is literally the same line that you saw on the previous slide. It shows you the average percentage of people taking moderate positions. The blue line is showing you the average percentage of people taking liberal positions. The red line, the average percentage taking conservative positions. You see that these percentages, liberal and conservative, they are fluctuating over time. But they have fluctuated in exactly the way that we have come to expect. In the United States, as soon as we elect a Republican president, people's views on average start to become less conservative and more liberal. As soon as we elect a Democratic president, people's views start to become less liberal and more conservative. So you do see fluctuation over time, but the differences over time are just not that great. It's useful to compare the shaded areas here. I'm comparing the year 2000, when Republican George Bush was elected, after eight years of a Democratic president, to the year 2016, when Republican Donald Trump was elected after eight years of a Democratic president. In that span, liberals went from 26% of the population to 28%. Conservatives went from 37% to 36%, so almost no change. Now, the right-hand side of this graph represents the Obama presidency. And during the Obama presidency, liberalism did wane. Conservatism, at least in terms of views toward issues, was on the rise in the United States. But now that a Republican president has been elected, there's very good reason to expect that pattern to reverse. Indeed, it probably has already reversed. Okay. As you see from the title of this slide, I don't take this evidence to be strong evidence of polarization. But this slide is telling us nothing about the parties, the political parties. And it's possible, it's possible that we see very little change in the population as a whole, even if the parties are diverging ideologically. So let's look at how Democrats and Republicans feel about the major issues. The question becomes, are Democrats and Republicans polarizing with respect to issue views? The answer is yes. And with this slide, I'm moving to the next part of the talk, in which I illustrate not ways in which America is not polarizing, but ways in which it is. Recall that those issue positions were measured on seven-point scales. If you answered, we can Think of your answer uh, to a question as being coded as one if it's extremely liberal. We can call it a seven if it's extremely conservative. 
And in this figure, I'm just showing you the average position of members in each party, where the average is taken over all issues. Please look to the left-hand side of the figure. The vertical distance between the red line and the blue line shows you that in 1992, the parties were separated by only 0.7 points on this 1 to 7 scale. Now look to the right-hand side. The vertical distance is much greater. It shows you that today, the parties are separated by 1.6 points on this 1 to 7 scale. In other words, the ideological distance between ordinary Republicans and ordinary Democrats has more than doubled in the last quarter century. These partisans have been diverging consistently for 20 years. And this divergence, on top of that, may be speeding up rather than slowing down. Now, I should pause for a second. In the previous slide, I showed you that people's issue views do not seem to be polarizing. They're not changing that much. In particular, the percentages of liberals and conservatives, and especially of moderates, have not changed that much over time. So how can it be that Republicans are becoming more conservative, even as Democrats are becoming more liberal? The answer is what political scientists call sorting what you might want to call a composition effect. People's views are not changing much, but people are sorting themselves into different parties on the basis of ideology, and they are doing this more than they used to. For most of the 20th century, yes, the Democratic Party was the more liberal party, but the Democratic Party had millions of conservatives, some of whom were very conservative. Similarly, the Republican Party was the conservative party but the Republican Party had millions of liberals, many millions, some of whom were quite liberal. But since the 1960s, conservatives have been leaving the Democratic Party and switching into the Republican Party. And at the same time, liberals have been leaving the Republican Party, switching into the Democratic Party. So we now have parties that are more homogeneous than before and farther apart from each other. And this is happening even though views in the population as a whole have not changed that much. And, and this is not the only way in which partisans are polarizing. They're, part, they're polarizing even more with respect to their self-perceptions. I'm not showing you here data anymore on people's views of specific issues, on the positions they take on issues. The ANES instead, or in addition, asks a more general question, which is, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a liberal or conservative or neither? If you say liberal, they ask you, well, how liberal do you see yourself? Likewise for conservatives. And regardless of the issue views, the issue, uh, the stands on issues that people are taking, what we find is that Republicans now describe themselves as more conservative than ever before. And Democrats describe themselves as more liberal than ever before. In 30 years, the difference between Democrats and, and Republicans in terms of their self-descriptions, perhaps their self-perceptions, it's tripled, more than tripled, in just 30 years. In addition, polarization in this sense may be accelerating too. You see, for example, the very sharp change in, among Democrats in just the last few years. It's partly because, for many decades, this term liberal was really stigmatized in the United States such that even many people who were liberal didn't want to call themselves liberal. That very much seems to be changing in this decade. Okay. These are data on people's perceptions of themselves, or at least their self-descriptions. Let me show you now what they say, not about themselves, but about the other party in general. I'm now showing you so-called feeling thermometer data. People are asked to say how they feel about each party. A score of zero means that you cannot stand a party. A score of 100 means it is the best thing in your life. And 50 means that you are neutral. You have no particular feeling. In this figure, it's a bit hard to see, but there is a horizontal gray bar in each panel. And that represents the point of neutrality. You neither like nor dislike a party. Of course, Democrats always like the Democratic Party more than Republicans do. And the opposite is true for Republicans. But look at how extraordinary these data are. On the left-hand side, in 1978, on average, Republicans in America were almost neutral about the Democratic Party. 
they could hardly be said to dislike it at all. And that makes 1978 very different from today, where Republicans, on average, give the Democratic Party a score of only 25 out of 100. And you see the same thing in the right-hand panel of this slide in evaluations of the Republican Party. In both cases, again, this gap between ordinary Democrats and ordinary Republicans has more than doubled. In this case, it has more than doubled in less than 40 years. That's a lot of polarization. And I would love to tell you that this polarization of this kind, that it's happening because people are just getting so much more positive about their own party. That's not the answer. It's clearly and overwhelmingly that they're getting more negative about the other party than they used to be. But this is just polarization of feelings toward parties in the abstract. When we ask about specific politicians, the pattern is even more stark. The previous polarization was almost mild by comparison. Here I'm showing you polarization of feelings about the presidential candidates from each party. On the left-hand side of the left-hand panel, you see that the gap in feelings about the Democratic candidate has grown from about 24 points in 1968 to 50 points in 2016. Hillary Clinton was a historically unpopular candidate, and I will return to that point. You see much the same on the right-hand side. Democrats actually used to be positive. They're not neutral. They're positive about the Republican candidate in 1968. That was Richard Nixon, by the way. Um, but the gap in feeling has grown from 20 points in 1968, the gap in feeling toward the Republican candidate, to nearly 50 points in 2016. Donald Trump was also a historically unpopular candidate. I'll be remiss if I don't show you one further very large way, quite distinct from all of the others, in which the parties are polarizing. These are not public opinion data at all, but it's so important that I feel I must talk about it. Up to now, I've just been showing you data from ordinary Americans. But some say that we find the sharpest polarization of all when we look to data from their representatives in Congress. This black line is a measure of the extent of polarization between Democratic and Republican representatives in Congress. It's based on data from all votes in Congress. It, what it shows us is that polarization declined throughout the first half of the 20th century. But since the 1970s, it has increased. And today, our Congress is more polarized along party lines than it has been in at least 120 years. Another and an intuitive way to think about it is this. For most of the 20th century, the parties overlapped in Congress. And what I mean by this is that the most liberal Republicans were actually more liberal than some Democrats in Congress. And the most conservative Democrats were more conservative than some Republicans in Congress. But now, for the last few decades, there's no overlap at all. If you want to know why is it so hard to pass laws or to get things done, this has to be a huge part of the answer. I now want to start building up to Donald Trump's election. I do think it's a special election, but I think not in ways that have been sufficiently appreciated. To some extent, every election cycle, almost all US politicians present themselves as outsiders. You can be president of the United States for four years and call yourself an outsider, a challenger to the established system. Everybody tries to do this. But Donald Trump really does have some skills to an enormous extent. And my own view is that more than any major party presidential candidate of my lifetime, much more, he forcefully and successfully presented himself as a true challenge to the established order. And that was a greater part of his candidacy. In some sense, that was his candidacy. It was certainly a greater part of his candidacy than the candidacies of any other major party candidate in my lifetime. So I think that should make us ask, why did so many people like his anti-establishment rhetoric? You know some of the answers, at least in part. So a shallow but important answer has to do with Americans' trust in their government. You probably know that it is low. What's less well known is that it used to be much, much higher. I'm showing you now 
two trends that trace each other quite closely. The gray line is showing you the percentages of Americans who trust the federal government to do what is right. And the black line is showing you the percentage of Americans who say that public officials care about people like me. In 1960, 75% of Americans said that they trusted the federal government to do what's right most of the time or almost always. And 75% also said, yes, public officials, they care about people like me. Trust declined steadily for more than 30 years, reaching a, a local minimum in 1994, when there was enormous discontent with the first two years of the Clinton administration. The course reversed after that, perhaps because of stellar economic growth in Clinton's second term in the late 1990s, followed by the terrorist attacks of 2001. But starting in 2002 or 2003, trust started to decline again. And now, in 2016, it's even lower than it was in 1994. Fewer than one in five Americans now say that public officials care about people like me. And again, I don't think that would be nearly as surprising if the percentages hadn't been so radically different in previous generations. I'm mentioning this just to set the stage for Trump's election. An anti-establishment candidate was able to succeed partly because trust in the establishment is so low. But I suspect, I'm certain, this is not the whole story. There's much more to say. Some rather grim demographic trends also play a role, and I want to speak about a few of them. Here's the best known one. It's the most studied demographic change in America. It's change in income that comes up in the study of income inequality. It's easy to find graphs like this one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's easy to find graphs like this one. I'm showing you dollar amounts for different percentiles of the income distribution. The top line is the are the households that are in the top 1%, the 99th percentile of the income distribution. Everything you see here is adjusted for inflation and presented in 2019 US dollars, 2019 US dollars. So the most obvious fact is that the top 1% in America is pulling away. And they are represented here by the top line. It's trickier to measure average income for households in the top 1% than at any other percentile. But even accounting for that difficulty, the trend is clear. In 1979, these top 1% households made about half a million dollars a year in income. Less than 25 years later, they had tripled that amount. They were making nearly $2 million per year. These four lines at the bottom of the graph, they're much harder to distinguish from each other. And in some sense, that's the point. But the second highest line here represents households in the 95th percentile. So they're still doing quite well relative to other Americans. And you might say that they're doing well in an absolute sense. Over the 50 years shown here, their incomes more than doubled, again, even after accounting for inflation. The next line, that's the 90th percentile, people, at the, people in the top 10%. They're doing well too, at least arguably. Their income nearly doubled after accounting for inflation. By contrast, the true middle class in the United States, the 50th percentile, they're not doing nearly so well. Their incomes went up after adjusting for inflation by only a third over this 50 year span. And you see much the same for those in the 10th percentile, um, those in, at the bottom 10th. And I'm afraid that this result is even worse than it seems. The number one reason why we see household income growth at all in the 50th percentile, in the 10th percentile, is because women now work and work full time far more than they used to in the United States. That's probably a good thing, but it tells us that income among men has been going down over time substantially in the last 50 years. Not for all men, but certainly for those in the bottom half of the income distribution. Okay, the major lesson here is that income inequality in America has been increasing. This is another sense in which Americans have been pulling apart. And there are still other senses in which Americans have been stratifying along class lines. 
These other senses are less well known, but I do think that they are part of a complete explanation for why a candidate as unusual as Donald Trump was able to succeed in 2016. This is where we get to the, the grim or the darkest part of the talk. We're now considering causes of death in the United States. I'm speaking of three causes, three major causes of premature death in the United States. Incidentally, they're, they're all higher in the United States than in the Czech Republic. So start with the black line, the line that doesn't move up or down. That represents deaths by shooting in the United States. Of course, guns get a huge amount of attention in the United States, probably rightly so. But the death rate from shootings has been enormously stable over the 15 year span shown here. A lot of attention, and still probably too little attention, is paid to deaths in the United States from motor vehicle accidents. Who is killed by cars and trucks in the United States? But here there's good news. I'm speaking now of the gray line on the slide. In the 15 year span shown here, that death rate declined by about a third. A little bit because people were driving less than they used to be. But it seems very likely that the main reason is something else. It's that cars have actually gotten safer. So that's the good news. The terrible news, not really well recognized in the United States, lies with the red line. It's deaths from drug abuse. Many people appreciate that the situation is bad. It's getting worse in some sense. Very few appreciate how much worse it has gotten. You may have heard of the war on drugs. This became a catchphrase in the United States in the 1980s when fears about cocaine and crack use were rising. But the death rate from drug abuse today in the United States is higher than at any point in the 1980s. And you see here that it tripled in just this 15 year period ending in 2014. What does this have to do specifically with Donald Trump? Well, you might think of it as signaling a general kind of discontent. But I have something a little bit more specific in mind. The increase in death rates from these sorts of deaths and others is not distributed evenly across the population. It very disproportionately affects those who are less well off. Let me drive this point home. Here you see data from Trump's base white Americans who are less well-educated. White Americans who are less well-educated. We should ask, why did this group so strongly support Donald Trump? Part of the answer is they are doing really poorly in the United States and they're doing worse than they did before. Specifically, what we are looking at here is change in mortality rates for white Americans whose education level puts them in the bottom 45% of all Americans with respect to education. So in 2015, that corresponds to finishing high school, but never starting college, not in any way. We like to think that mortality rates are declining. It's one of the signs of a well-functioning society. But among young, less educated white Americans, in the last quarter century, the mortality rates have nearly doubled. The peak that you see here is for 30-year-old Americans at this relatively low education level, and the evidence suggests that their mortality rate, while still far lower than it is in many countries, has grown by 80%, grew by 80% between 1992 and 2015. This is a reversal of a centuries long trend. Absent a big war, you do not expect these kinds of spikes in the mortality rate. So I've been using these last few slides to set the stage for Trump's election. His election signals deep discontent with ordinary life in the US. And these data suggest some reasons why you might see such discontent. But now I want to speak more directly to Trump's election. We tend to think that it was extraordinary because Donald Trump is an extraordinary president. But the truth is that voting patterns in 2016, in some senses, were ordinary. Yes, the outcome was very different from the outcomes of other elections. In the previous election, for example, we elected Barack Obama. Barack Obama is very different from Donald Trump. But that doesn't mean that there's a big change in the electorate. The American system is such that very small changes in voting patterns can produce enormous changes in the outcomes. And that is what happened between 2012 and 2016. 
Because my emphasis is on the voting patterns of ordinary Americans, I want to show you that the 2016 election at the right-hand side of this slide was not special at that level. And to some extent, I've already done this. For example, I showed you that nearly 90% of Democrats who voted voted for Clinton. And historically, that's a very common percentage. And nearly 90% of Republicans who voted voted for Trump. This slide is showing you a second way in which the 2016 election was not a big change. No, it's still the same slide. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> in 2012, Barack Obama won 51.9% of the so-called two-party vote. He won 51.9% of all of the votes that went to either the Democrat or the Republican. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won 51.1% of the two-party vote. It's a very small change. In fact, it's the smallest change of that kind that we had seen in America in over 100 years. So again, the 2016 election, in this sense, does not look unusual. It looks quite normal. This is a contrast, by the way, with developments in Europe. So earlier in the year, you had Fernando Casal Bertois speak about volatility in European elections over the course of the 20th century up to today. And he said, this period that we are living in right now, the last 20 years, this is the period of the greatest volatility in elections that we have seen in 100 years. That's not what you're seeing here. You're seeing the other extreme, a period not of um, extreme volatility in, a, in percentage voting for the Democrat, but extreme stability. Okay. Having said this, having made a case that in some sense, in some meaningful sense, it was an ordinary election, I do want to pick out now a few trends that I think are quite important that are exceptional that are not trends that we necessarily anticipated in advance. I did not anticipate this. I would not have believed this until I actually made a figure like this. For more than 50 years, um, the ANES has been asking people whether they like or dislike the major party candidates for president. The data show that Hillary Clinton was the second most disliked major party nominee in recorded history. She's represented here by the blue bar. The Democratic Party, as far as we can tell, had never in its history nominated somebody so unpopular. Probably had, but not, um, certainly not in the post-war era. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, the remote doesn't seem to be working, so I'm, I'm just forgetting. Thank you. No, we're almost, I'm almost done, so. I'll, I'll try to be better. Okay, so Hillary Clinton is represented here by the blue bar. The Democratic Party, at least in the post-World War II era, seems never to have nominated somebody so disliked by Americans. In all of our recorded history, which is to say from 1956 on, only one major party presidential nominee was even more disliked. And that was Donald Trump, the Republican nominee in 2016. The United States had never had an election in which any major party nominee was disliked by a majority of Americans. But in 2016, both major party candidates were disliked by most people in the United States. And that helps to explain this next result. So it's election day 2016 in the United States. I would not, I don't know of anybody who really was confident that Donald Trump was going to win. There probably were such people, but certainly in my community of scholars, granted there probably is a liberal bias there, I don't know a single person who would have bet on Donald Trump to win an election, certainly not with even odds. And so, and part of the reason was that Hillary Clinton was leading in the polls and leading substantially in a number of those polls. So how can we explain how Hillary Clinton, well, how Donald Trump did so well given those polls? Well, here's a large part of the answer. Given that the candidates were so unpopular, perhaps it should not be surprising that many Americans had a lot of trouble making up their minds. I'm showing you on this slide the percentages of people who had not decided whom to vote for um, with 100 days to go before the election. That's the gray line. And then literally on the morning of election day, that's the black line. And what the black line is showing you is that on the right-hand side, in 2016, 
more than one out of eight people who actually voted woke up not sure about who they were going to vote for. More than one out of eight. And that is the highest percentage on record. You might wonder, how can that be the highest percentage on record? Because you see that there are higher points than 2016 at the far right on this graph. For example, in 1980, the percentage was higher, and in the 1990s, the percentage was higher. Here's the explanation. The data that I have and that I'm showing you here combine these so-called late undecided voters with another group, uh, namely those who support third party candidates, some candidate who's not a Democrat or a Republican. And I don't have the data to tease apart those two groups. But I know that in 2016, there were no major third party candidates. By contrast, in both 1980 and the 1990s, there were major third party candidates. So taking that into account, that's why I say that a historically high proportion of voters were undecided even extremely late into the election season in 2016. And that, again, helps to explain why Donald Trump won, even though Hillary Clinton was leading in the polls just before Election Day. I, I should be very clear. Hillary Clinton did win more votes. But because of the American system, the person who wins the most votes is not always the person who becomes president. And that's what happened in 2016. OK. You might want to ask the question about Trump's election in a slightly different way. Not about how did he win, given that the polls were what they were, but simply, how did he win given that he was so unpopular? Many answers to that question. I'm going to give you one of them. I'm focusing now on the 74% of American voters who are white. These data are only from whites, from white voters. I'm showing you how they voted in 2012 when Democrat Barack Obama ran against Republican Mitt Romney and how they voted in 2016 when Trump ran against Clinton. The most important finding here is that more than one out of every eight people who voted for Obama in 2012 turned around and voted for Trump in 2016. Trump was, he was and is a talented politician and he was very good at getting the votes, if not of Democrats, then at least of people who had supported Barack Obama. By contrast, Hillary Clinton was terrible at getting votes from people who had supported the Republican candidate four years earlier. She got only 3% of the votes of people who had supported Mitt Romney, the Republican, in 2012. All right. Let me give you one last demonstration, absolutely critical of a way in which the 2016 election was unprecedented. Each of the 50 states is divided into different regions, counties. And you see here a comparison of the highest and lowest education counties in each state. The black line is an estimate of the percentage of the vote in the highest education counties that goes to the Democratic candidate. The gray line is an estimate of the percentage of the Democratic vote from the lowest education counties that goes to the Democratic candidate. And you see that for a quarter century, from 1972 through 1996, there was really very different, very little difference between the high and the low education counties on this dimension. We couldn't say in those years that either party had an advantage by level of education. The 2000 election between George W. Bush and Al Gore was a watershed in this regard because that's when we started to see a significant divergence. That's when we started to see the higher education counties supporting George, I'm sorry, supporting Al Gore, uh, the Democratic candidate, more than the lower education counties. And in 2016, that gap was bigger than ever. And we just didn't imagine that it could get this big. It, by one estimate shown here, the highest education counties were 30 percentage points more likely to support Hillary Clinton than the lowest education counties. Now, you might think that's not necessarily so bad for Hillary Clinton. Um, because, yes, perhaps she's losing support among the low education voters, but she's gaining it among the high education voters. But the situation for Hillary Clinton is actually worse than this figure suggests. White people, remember, are a large majority of voters in the United States. And if you look at voting among whites alone, you see an even more striking pattern. Here are the percentages of whites who said just before the election that they were going to vote for Clinton or for Trump. 
we've got four education categories here, ranging from people whose education at most ended with high school graduation to those who finished their bachelor's degree and then went on to get some kind of graduate education. You can see a lot from this table. First, Trump did extraordinarily well among whites whose education stopped at high school. He got 80% of the vote of men, and there are a lot of these people, 80% um, of the votes of white men whose education stopped with high school. Second, at every education level, including the highest education level, Trump won the votes of men. Third, and this is really striking, even among whites who graduated from college, Trump was the overall favorite. This aspect of Clinton's unpopularity has not been appreciated. Conventional wisdom, even in political science, is Hillary Clinton succeeded in this sense. She was the high education candidate. Well, it seems that she did not even win a majority of whites who had, whose education finished with a bachelor's degree. Now, again, Clinton did win the popular vote. What this table shows you is that she was able to do so partly because of her huge advantage among white women who had very high levels of education, 58% to 36%. But even more than that, it's what you don't see here um, that helped Clinton out. She was the overwhelming favorite of non-white voters, the 26% of voters who were not white. In general, Clinton's unpopularity has been too little discussed as a factor in the 2016 election. People know, they understand that Trump was an unpopular candidate. But if you ask, how did he then manage to win? A huge part of the answer has to be that he was facing another extremely unpopular candidate. Please. So you said both were so unpopular. How did that so high in the first place? You mean, how did they become the candidates? That is a, that is a fantastic question. Um, there are really two answers. There's one for Clinton, and there's a very different answer for Trump. Um, the answer for Hillary Clinton is that she was very possibly the most prominent politician in America who was not Barack Obama. Barack Obama could not run again. Um, and there was, she was challenged and challenged very seriously in the, in, the contest, in the Democratic primary, the contest to win the Democratic nomination. But the establishment of the Democratic Party lined up behind her. And she was among Democrats not unpopular among Democrats. And so she was the combination of being very famous and somewhat popular among Democrats and having the establishment line up behind her meant that she became the Democratic Party nominee. The answer is very different for Donald Trump. Um, Donald Trump got very lucky. People say he got lucky to win the general election. Again, I think Trump is a very talented politician, but and I agree that in some sense he was lucky to win the general election, but there's no question he was even more lucky to win the Republican nomination. There were many politicians who were competing for the Republican nomination, and in the beginning, very few people took Donald Trump seriously. But the way that it, the contest works to become the Republican nominee is, it's not like there's an election all over the United States at once. There are 50 states and, and each of them votes at a different time. Trump campaigned very hard. He worked very hard to win the Republican nomination. And he, when people didn't think he had much of a chance, he managed to win the election with, say, to, with very roughly speaking, 20% of the vote was enough to win the election in some of those very early states, like the state of New Hampshire. Um, and once he started to win states, he gained a lot of momentum. Then people started to take his candidacy more seriously. And that helps to explain how he won. Even accounting for that, he barely won. Um, this was a case in which it could easily have gone another way. There could have been another nominee. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Please. So, the end, is there some survey in connection to the media? Because uh, after the election, mm -hmm. uh, for example, CNN has admitted that they gave, gave Trump a lot of coverage, more yeah. than to any other candidate, mainly because they were amazed how this person came even run for president. So is there some connection to the media coverage? Oh, there absolutely is. You're asking in general, is, was, is there a connection to media coverage? Oh, unquestionably. Trump, got a, Trump did not pay for that much advertising, particularly when Trump was running for the, nom the Republican nomination. 
most established Republicans, the large majority, in fact, did not want Trump. He might have been their least favorite candidate, not their most favorite candidate. Um, but Trump is, and I mean this purely in a rhetorical or stylistic sense, he has a, a, a great talent of a very specific kind to speak to large audiences. And so he would give these talks, and he could attract audiences that other people, or audiences of a size that perhaps no other candidate could match in the Republican Party. And so his campaign became a spectacle for two reasons. One is because he was drawing these crowds. The other is because many people, and I believe many journalists, they just thought, this is crazy. Um, because remember what Donald Trump was famous for. He was famous for being rich. He was famous for promoting himself on television. But this is, he had never, for example, he had no elected political experience. He's the first politician, the first president in American history who never, held, who never either held elected office nor served in the military. The country had been around for 200 years and we'd never had somebody with that kind of record. So he was a spectacle, I believe, entertaining to think about because, you know, he could never win. Um, many, many Americans and I believe very many journalists felt that way as well. I, I know that there is some regret among the journalistic community in the United States about the way that they treated his candidacy. Um, I should leave it at that. Uh, any other questions? Please. was uh, solely uh, caused by the fact that she was the combination that you mentioned of like a prominent and very famous politician? Or could it be some characteristics of Bernie Sanders that was facing her? Oh. Like the age or I don't know, I, ethnicity or whatever? It wouldn't be ethnicity. Um, it might not be age either. Yes, Bernie Sanders was older than Hillary Clinton, but they were both comparatively old. They were both significantly older than Barack Obama, for example. It's a question that I've asked myself. It's a very difficult question to answer because I don't know about that counterfactual. I don't know what's the world in which Hillary Clinton is running against a, a younger, more conservative, more vibrant um, challenger. Some would say that Bernie Sanders was pretty vibrant. Um, I would certainly... Bernie Sanders, appeared, Bernie Sanders was the name of the, of the challenger that Hillary Clinton faced in the Democratic primary. He was running to the left of Hillary Clinton. He was more liberal than Hillary Clinton. It is a very interesting question to ask. If you had had a candidate like Bernie Sanders, his liberalism was part of his appeal, so let's hold his liberalism constant, but let's say that he's younger, that he has better name recognition even before he starts running. Would he have won the primary over Hillary Clinton? I find it very hard to say. The reason I find it hard to say is that I was surprised at how well Bernie Sanders did in the Democratic primary. He did much better than I thought. Because you mentioned you know, the uh, gradual, let's say, radicalization, but not per se, of the both parties. Mm -hmm. So it would be logical that the, you know, the Democrats, radicalizing as they are, would go for, you know, Indeed, and it was a wake-up call to many of us who follow the Democratic Party in the United States politics. We didn't anticipate that Bernie Sanders would win as much support as he did, and part of the reason is, well, he really was, by American standards, quite a liberal politician. Um, he's unlikely to win the nomination for president this year. He's running again. But it's at least arguable that he has had a significant effect on American politics in this decade. Any other questions? Please. Uh, two questions, Sandra. Yeah. Uh, why was Hillary Clinton so hated? Because, like, it's obvious with Donald Trump, but with Hillary Clinton, it doesn't fit as much. Yeah. And uh, are the Republic, uh, the Democrats, doing the same mistake again by nominating or promoting Joe Biden because he seems almost the same as Hillary because he's prominent and he's Barack Obama's best friend? And Those are. Excellent questions. Those are terribly difficult questions. Um, I have a complicated answer. So the first part of my answer, and I mean this sincerely, is um, I have the great fortune to be here at Masaryk University. My visit is sponsored in part by the Fulbright Association. Um, so in some sense, the United States is funding my trip here, which means that I'm wary of, I, I can say many things about the, the electoral history, about the candidates, but I don't want to sound too partisan. Let me speak directly to your first question now. Why was Hillary Clinton so disliked? 
I do not have a great answer. I don't have a comprehensive answer. I don't know all of the parts of that answer. But one part of the answer is certainly this. Hillary Clinton became known in American politics not in 2000 when she ran for, uh, not in 2008 when she ran for president, but in 1992 when her husband Bill Clinton was elected president. And if you look at tr certain kinds of polarization in the United States, the 1990s, when Bill Clinton was president, it's an exceptional time. By some measures, you see polarization starting to really accelerate in that time. Um, and it was partly because opponents, people who did not like the Clinton presidency, fixed on the Clintons in particular, both of them, as their targets. I'm, I'm not saying that this is the only reason why Hillary Clinton was disliked. I, I don't believe it was. But she had been in the public eye, and to a substantial extent, in a negative way for a quarter century, since 1992. Um, we use this term baggage to mean that there's a sort of legacy that people carry around, whether or not they deserve it. And that might apply to Hillary Clinton. Does that make sense? No, the second question is the one that I really have uh, trouble answering. Would they be making a mistake to elect Joe Biden again? Um, it's very hard to say, partly because we're still far from the election, far from the general election. A lot can change. The polls are, in fact, changing. Um, polling does suggest that right now, that Joe, or at least as of a couple of weeks ago, that Joe Biden is more popular in the country at large than the main alternatives. Elizabeth Warren, the senator from Massachusetts, for example. Um, But I would really, given that I was really quite wrong about what happened in 2016, um, I, I think some humility on my part is in order. I really don't want to say either that it would be right or wrong to nominate, just from a purely electoral perspective, to nominate Joe Biden. Um, that's certainly the question that I'm going to be thinking about in the, couple, in the coming months, though. Any other questions? Please. Oh, uh, here first? Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that a lot of these polarization trends started in the 1990s. Some of them, yes. Is yeah. it possible that the end of the Cold War plays a role here? Like a disappearance of the common enemy? It's, a, it's an excellent question. I tend to doubt it. I should qualify. It's not so much that polarization began in, in any sense that I can think of in the 1990s, but that it accelerated in some senses. Um, some analyses of polarization in Congress, for example, show, yes, Congress was polarizing. The Democrats and the Republicans were pulling apart as early as the 1970s, but that that trend really accelerated in the 1990s during the Clinton presidency. Um, I, no, I tend to think not. Um, I tend to think that the end of the Cold War was not a reason, is not a reason why we saw polarization accelerating. That would make sense if we could say that in some sense the Cold War was a phenomenon that really unified, at least to some extent, the Democratic and Republican parties. Not obvious that it was. Certainly, if you think about the 1970s and the 1980s, I, there were many Democrats, for example, who voted for Ronald Reagan. And I suppose they might have been latching on partly to Reagan's stauncher anti-communism than to the anti-communism of leading Democrats. But the best evidence we have suggests that Americans just don't care that much about foreign policy, and they would lump this into foreign policy. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, here and then here. Yeah, I just wanted to comment maybe that uh, we have to take into account gender here because it's it's very visible that basically only in the last band you have women mm -hmm. who actually voted for a woman. The rest just vote for. So even in a worst case scenario, people will vote for a stupid man rather than a stupid woman, <laughs> let's say, uh, or like a bad guy or a bad woman, yeah. whatever you know. But, the thing is, like, if you just look at the, the numbers, it's pretty obvious. I would put it this way. So remember, we're looking at white Americans here. And so there was a lot of hope among Democrats in 2016 that there would be kind of gender solidarity. Especially, it's not just that Hillary Clinton was, the, was running for president, the first major party nominee to be a woman in the United States. It's that she was running against a very special kind of man, Donald Trump. Um, so there was a lot of hope that the fact of that Hillary Clinton is a woman would be especially attractive to women who were voting. It does not seem to have played out that way, really at all, with the exception of the very last row on this slide, um, which is those very highly educated women. Heather. Yes, um, just jumping 
off of what you said, anecdotally, that makes sense to me as an American. I grew up um, in a very conservative Christian Republican home and was raised to think of Russia as the great bear of the apocalypse, like coming to destroy the world. And now Republicans are all okay with Russia. So this sort of, it is interesting because when I was young, being liberal was an epithet. And I, it took me a very long time to, um, what do you call, like, un- embrace it. Yeah, to, to become liberal, to say, it. oh, because you would say, oh, I'm not liberal. Like, you wanted to make peace with the Republicans, even as, or with the conservatives, even, even if you were, yourself were liberal. Mm-hmm. And we've had 20 something years of right wing propaganda and Hillary hatred and misogyny. Mm-hmm. So that's just my anecdote. Um, I wonder if the collapse of the Cold War could have turned the evangelical right um, towards the enemy of the left even more within the country. Possi- certainly it's possible. I, I, don't, I just don't have the data to speak to it, but, but I have to grant that it's possible. Was there another question up here? Yes. Thank you very much uh, for both questions and lecture. Uh, just, one, just two questions, short <laughs> question. Um, a lot of was written about uh, the role of financial, crisis, uh, of financial crisis and the polarization, mm-hmm. and I just miss it maybe in your, in your lecture if you can more comment on the role of the financial crisis on the polarization and then on the Trump's election. Um, uh, and the second one, maybe it's connected, uh, it's linked a bit. Uh, could you clarify more the link between uh, the death caused by uh, drugs and uh, yeah. polarization? Um, so let me take up the... Um, the economic crisis of 2008 first. I tend to think of the economic crisis of 2008 as contributing less to polarization than to Barack Obama's election. I'm not saying that Barack Obama would have lost in 2008 if there had been no economic crisis. I am saying I don't know whether he would have won. It's possible that he would have lost. Um, Economic crisis in 2008 and Donald Trump's election in 2016. Is there a connection? Very arguably, and the argument goes like this. You might say, oh, there's no connection because that was so far in the past. But the recovery in the United States from the crash of 2008 has really been uneven, from the recession of 2008. Some groups have recovered better than others. And it's certainly been argued that the very people who supported Trump most heavily, whites who were less well-educated, are people who have been exceptionally slow to, to recover from the crisis. In other words, wealthy Americans today are doing better than they were in 2007, at least by, me- uh, by many measures, high-income Americans. But what about the many Americans, the the large majority of Americans who are not high income, who are perhaps even below the median income. Have they recovered? That's very arguable. And um, certainly when you look at income and jobs, the recovery for for that group of people does not look stellar. And again, those were the people who were Donald Trump's base. I'm sorry, you had another question though. Economic crisis and? Oh, demographic. Demographic trends. Right, so why am I showing you something like, uh, I'll change it here as well. Um, like, is this the sort of thing that you're asking about? It's, uh, I guess there's a twofold reason. One is that there's an abstract sense in which Americans always acknowledge that things are bad in the United States. Um, but the extent of the badness, that is, how extreme these bad trends are, I'm singling, I'm singling out here deaths from drug abuse, I think that's extraordinary and it deserves more attention than it's been getting in the United States. The vast majority of Americans say, oh yeah, drug abuse is a problem. They don't know about that red line. Um, And the connection to the Trump election is this. No one expected Donald Trump to do as well among uh, among relatively low education white Americans as he did. Um, he, did, he, he didn't do as well as his Republican predecessors. He did better than his predecessors. So people then started to ask, well, why? Why did he do so well? And then they turned to trends like this. Now, these data are not exclusively from white Americans who have relatively low education levels. But what I'm not showing you here, and is nevertheless true, that is that data like these, dispiriting demographic trends, are disproportionately affecting exactly that group of people who turned out to vote for Trump in overwhelming numbers. That's the connection that I'm suggesting. Please. Yeah, it seems to me that um, what you've said is consistent with my own theory here, which is that the political parties have simultaneously lost the ability to really screen candidates for being suitable. I mean, it's clear for Trump, 
Yeah. Um, that their their nominating systems can be hacked, mm -hmm. but people still assume that a major party nominee is a suitable candidate for president. They trust that the parties are fulfilling that function in some way, which is why you get 90% of the partisans voting for the nominee. And, and even on the other side, in 2016, you saw a milder demonstration of this because Hillary Clinton's campaign and the Democratic establishment were criticized for supposedly rigging the system against Bernie Sanders as if what little control they were still exercising as a party to decide who should be our presidential nominee, which is our single most important decision we ever make, mm -hmm. they should surrender even that. Indeed. Um, it's been a major theme in, in political science in the United States. Um, some excellent political scientists wrote a very poorly timed book called The Party Decides. Yeah, exactly. The Party Decides, meaning that it might seem that American elections are democratizing such that the parties can no longer choose who is nominated. But the point of this book was actually, no, the parties do still retain the ultimate influence. Uh, the clearest single data point to suggest that that's not so is the Republican nomination of Donald Trump. It was extremely hard to find established Republicans who wanted Donald Trump to win. He was probably the least favorite choice of all of the nominees among the vast majority of Republicans. But to take up something else that you've said, that people sort of infer that a, part, that a politician is reasonable if he gets the nomination, well, it's tricky. They, they might think that he's viable if he gets the nomination. They might think that he is more their sort of person than someone on the other side just by virtue of getting the nomination. The only reason I hesitate is that there were many millions of Trump supporters who did not want a reasonable candidate in the ordinary sense, probably the sense that you and I share. They wanted Trump because he was unreasonable, because no leading Republicans wanted him, and they couldn't stand the Republican Party either, even if they felt closer to the Republican than the Democratic Party. How much more time do I have? Excellent. Uh, are there any other questions? All right. Uh, please. <laughs> uh, I was thinking because you showed us this graph uh, going from 1960s towards today and the, the polarization has been growing. Uh, does it have to do anything maybe in terms of um, liberal people being more vocal about their liberal views and also maybe radical people being more radical about their views openly in public? Yes, and, and your question speaks I think in part to Heather's comment recently. Mm -hmm. um, let me take up this idea that polarization might have something to do uh, with, not just with people's views changing, perhaps not with their views changing, but with the idea that certain people are simply more outspoken about their views than they used to be. That's your idea, right? I mean, like, you know, civil rights, LGBT stuff, mm -hmm. people are more vocal about their identities nowadays than they used to be maybe, I don't know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Certainly. So that um, changes maybe the... Uh, absolutely. Um, and to that, I would add that Again, it's an important fact in American politics if you think that how people talk about themselves is important. This term liberal was to some extent stigmatized in the United States. It is no longer stigmatized nearly as much. On top of that, more than ever before in America, um, people who think of themselves as liberal have been moving into the Democratic Party. Either they used to not affiliate with the party or they even used to affiliate with the Republican Party. Now they filter into the Democratic Party. For the first time in American history, I haven't shown you this, but in 2016, for the first time in American history, a majority of Americans who think of themselves as liberal also call themselves Democrats, and that had never been true before. What does this have to do with the idea that people are more outspoken? Well, I can tell a story that I think is plausible. I can't prove it. It's very simple. It's that if you were a liberal in previous decades and thought of yourself as a liberal, it wasn't obvious that you had, it wasn't always obvious that you had a, a home, an organizational home for your fellow liberals, certainly not one that was a major player in American politics. Today, you do have a home and it's called the Democratic Party. At least that is certainly the direction of the trend. And perhaps feeling like you have that home, that backing, makes it easier to speak up, both for changes that you want inside your own party and outside of it. Does that sound plausible? Thank you. Any other questions? Please. Uh, so, um, uh, 
and the Americans voted for Barack Obama. Yeah. Man was the first black president. Mm -hmm. seems, seems to me like the most liberal choice people there could make, yeah? He was in the office for eight years. Eight years, that's right. Um, that doesn't seem to me like uh, time long enough for such a, such a drastic change mm -hmm. to shift from Barack Obama to someone like Donald Trump. So my question, and uh, maybe it's a bit silly, is that did or has Obama's administration made some kind of mistake or some kind, has it failed the people that they choose to, to support someone, a, a personality like Donald Trump, mm -hmm. instead of more liberal candidates? I see two questions here. Correct me if I'm wrong. The first question, or the question I'll take up first is, was there a sense in which Obama failed people who wanted a liberal president? And then second, how can it be that people that we could go so quickly from someone who seems liberal like Barack Obama to someone who seems conservative like Donald Trump? Is that correct? Okay, so for the first question, did Barack Obama fail liberals in the United States? I do not think so. This is a charge that um, some Democrats and liberals make. They say, we are disappointed. Uh, we thought that we were getting a, uh, someone who was more liberal than Barack Obama turned out to be. My own view is that this criticism reflects insufficient examination of Obama's record. If you want to look for liberal moves or liberal accomplishments of the Obama administration, they are not hard to find. And that's true whether you're thinking about, um, let's say, it's true in foreign and domestic policy, it's true with healthcare, it's true in taxes. You can even argue, very arguably, that it's true in immigration, which is where Obama is perhaps most criticized now among liberals. Um, it's even more true though, and this is critical, when you think about the awesome impediments to action that Obama was facing, that any president now faces when Congress is controlled by the other party. And in general, the Republican Party had more power in Congress when Democrat Barack Obama was in the White House. It made it hard to get anything done. In fact, what's striking is that he got as much done as he did, um, given Republican opposition in Congress. So that's my answer to the question about Barack Obama failing liberals. It is a there are certain sentiments that are just common in American political history. You hear them in today. You heard them 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. One of these sentiments is that supporters, especially on the left, that supporters of a Democratic candidate, capital D Democratic candidate, later say, I was disappointed. He didn't turn out to be as liberal as I'd hoped. And I tend to think that those sorts of criticisms are misplaced, that they reflect either insufficient examination of the record or insufficient examination of the candidate's promises before he came to office or both. Your other question is extremely important. It's how did we go so quickly from Obama to, to Trump's totally different candidates or very different candidates, right? Um, the biggest part of the answer here has to do with the American electoral system, which is very unlike any proportional representation system. The American electoral system is one in which even in a country in which well over 100 million people are voting, switching an extremely small percentage of votes, far fewer than 1% of total votes, means that you can go from electing Barack Obama president to electing Donald Trump president. And in this century, we've had so many close elections. The normal election is like that. Um, the winner is hard to predict in advance, and small changes in just a few, few of the United States can change the outcome for the entire country. Any other questions? All right, if you remember nothing else from this talk, here's what I'd most like you to remember. Four points. First, parties are diverging, polarizing, with respect to a lot of different dimensions, with respect to issue views, their self-perceptions, their liking, or perhaps I should say disliking, of the parties, their feelings about candidates. And their representatives in Congress are arguably polarizing even more. Second, and this second point is especially true when we focus not on Congress, but on public opinion at large, most of this divergence of the parties does not seem to be due to true attitude change. It's not that we have a much greater percentage of liberals than in the past, or a much greater percentage of conservatives in the past. No. In fact, instead, I should say, it's mainly due to sorting, to a compositional change. 
It's due to the fact that both of these parties contain many tens of millions of people, but in the past, there used to be millions of liberals in the Republican Party, millions of conservatives in the Democratic Party. For more than 50 years now, the conservatives have been leaving the Democratic Party and entering the Republican Party. The liberals have been leaving the Republican Party and entering the Democratic Party. The result is that when we look at average opinion in the parties, it's diverging. Each party has become more homogeneous and the average opinion in each party is further apart than it used to be. And this can happen, this could happen even if nobody is changing their issue views. Third, there's a lot of frustration in the United States and some of it is likely to come from worsening conditions among the least well-off. Income inequality, deaths from drug abuse, overall mortality rates. The trends here are really quite surprising and all of this is getting worse. And last, our most recent presidential election was really ordinary in some respects. It did not mark a, for example, a huge Republican surge. It's not like Donald Trump won so many millions more votes or so many, uh, much higher percentage of the votes of the vote than his predecessor Mitt Romney in 2012. But having said that, this 2016 election really was historic in other ways. It featured two historically unpopular candidates and it featured historic polarization by education level. It's wonderful to have the chance to share these ideas with you. Thank you.